Welcome to Living in the Solution with Dr. Elena George. Today we're going to have an, a really fun show, I think a very informative show and obviously very timely since we're living in economic times that are uncertain. There's been a change in our collective take on what constitutes being an American. I think we're moving in a socialism direction. Capitalism has been demonized along with things that when where I grew up, considering myself an American and a thinker, seems to be on the outs right now. So today we're going to speak with Dr. Richard Salzman. He's a professor of political economy at Duke University, a senior fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research, and a senior scholar at the Atlas Society. He's the author of numerous books, chapters, and articles, and his most recent book is Where Have All the Capitalists Gone? Essays in Moral Political Economy. And you can find his work at his website, Richard Salzman, and that's last name, his last name is spelled S-A-L-S-M-A-N dot com. And Professor, I'm looking forward to our conversation because I remember growing up, it was about how hard you worked. It wasn't about being victim. It wasn't about the color of your skin or your sex. It was about work hard. And you, if you have merit, then you will achieve. And my dad came from a different country as an immigrant. And he worked, you know, his heart out along with my mom. And we didn't use race or sex as a reason not to succeed. We worked hard. And, and the American dream back in the day was you can achieve whatever you wanted to. And I don't think that's what's going on. I remember there's been a movement towards demonizing capitalism. And, you know, I, my take on it is that what they're demonizing and what exists now is not really capitalism, it's cronyism. And I want you to, to discuss today exactly what capitalism is and what makes it different than what it's being purported to be. Well, I thank you, first of all, for having me, Dr. George. It's a delight uh, to be with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was raised the same way. Uh, I think the main thing here is free will. Do you have free will? Now, we all are raised in different circumstances, of course, but, but the idea that you have choice over your life, that you have agency, uh, even for those with uh, fewer assets than others, uh, is really a crucial uh, premise. And, and I believe the premise of the American way, if you will. Now, certainly, America improved over time, right? At one, one time, was maybe considered consistent, systemically racist. But it was 60 years ago that MLK said, judge people by their character, not by the color of their skin. So, yes, that has been lost. It's tragic. I agree. You asked about capitalism. Capitalism, uh, interestingly, is fairly new. I mean, this will sound weird, but relative to socialism, which goes all the way back to the pharaohs of pre-ancient time, but capitalism is about 300 years old. It really was only begun during the Industrial Revolution in the, they call it the 1700s, maybe mid-1700s, I would say. And prior to that, we had what was called a renaissance and an enlightenment. And renaissance means rebirth. It was really a rebirth of respect for reason and science, which had been lost for a thousand years during the Dark Ages. And uh, of course, enlightenment meant enlightened by reason. So as opposed to darkness, the world is lit up by science. And you know the field of medicine quite well. You know, we go from quackery to real science and medicine. And so all the fields, including mine, finance, banking, uh, were uh, illuminated, if you will, by the enlightenment. And that was quite one of the great things about it. And, and fortunately, America, this country, was founded right in the middle of the Enlightenment uh, in the 1700s or so. So the Constitution was ratified in 1787. There was a counter-revolution, however, in the 1830s or so. And that led to people like Marx and others criticizing capitalism. So it has, uh, I would say, the status of capitalism or the view of it or the respect for it. Uh, has oscillated over the decades and centuries since then. Now, one of the reasons I wrote my book, Where Have All the Capitalists Gone? One thing is a capitalist, if you ask the average person, will say, well, that's someone on Wall Street. So capitalist means a financier. And then a bad description of what a capitalist is, a supply capital uh, to business. But I'm using it also in the sense of an advocate of the system of capitalism. You know, if you said 
hey, I have, I know someone who's a socialist. What is a socialist? Well, not someone who's just uh, sociable. <laughs> it's a socialist is an ad- advocate of the system of socialism. Well, what's very odd is that there are many socialists, uh, ideologically, so, and not that many ideological capitalists. In other words, there are many financiers, uh, but you don't find that many people willing to stand up and defend capitalism as a system, even though Dr. Jones has had this wonderful albeit short track record of delivering prosperity, of typically delivering liberty and freedom for cultures of choice, all those kind of things. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so it, it's a mystery, and that's why I titled my book and it was an interrogative of where of all the capital is gone. I can elaborate on that, but I just wanted to give you that that basic introduction of the whole thing. Uh, there's more to say than that, but I'll start with that. Well, I think that's a really good primer, actually. And, you know, I I don't think of economics in terms of ethics, but there is a difference, isn't there, between the ethics of capitalism or, or what underpins it versus socialism? And can you tease that out? Because it seems, seems to me in socialism a lot about emotion. It's not about reason. It's about how people feel. And people are told how to feel, and that drives their choices. And it doesn't mean it's not... It's not rational. People are telling you things that are not true. We're not living in Jim Crow. We're not living in the 50s before the age of civil rights. But people are making it sound like this is the worst country in the world. And it's driving that narrative, which from a capitalist standpoint, it's a different mindset, isn't it? It's reason versus emotion. That's how I see it. Is that correct? Very much so. It's not as if uh, capitalists or people in America or in free countries don't have emotions. Uh, you know, for, for one thing, they, they prize the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is an emotion. No, but I think you're getting some, to something really, very real here. The system of capitalism is not just about economics. You mentioned ethics. It's, it's all, it is also about morality. Now, most people think capitalism may be productive. It may produce the goods, but there's something that's somehow unfair about it something so unjust, maybe even immoral about it. And that is a big problem. That is one of the reasons why people will not often embrace capitalism. So I'd put it this way. Capitalism, uh, beyond the economics of it, just the free market abundance that it produces, let's let's move beyond that, just stipulate. Even socialists admit that. They admit that capitalism is the productive system. But I put it this way. It's also the system of individualism. And when you ever put an ism on something, you have to explain. It prizes the individual uh, and the things we were talking about earlier, the individual's free choice and liberty and things like that is not true in socialism. Socialism is exactly named, actually, in the sense that it, it, it places a premium on society, on the group, on the collective. And in its most severe form, it will say the individual must serve the collective. This, the individual must be subordinated to the collective, even if necessary, if the individual suffers for the sake of the collective. Now, who leads the collective and who says what the collective's goals are? Well, those are the leaders. And how do they, how do they become leaders? Uh, you know, by promises or maybe appealing to the emotions of the group. Mm-hmm. But you're, you're absolutely on to something. That capitalism is basically a system that not everybody under capitalism will be this way, but it's a system that promotes the idea of you're an individual, you have rights. Uh, you have the pursuit of happiness, not the pursuit of suffering. It's interestingly, the pursuit of happiness is no guarantee you'll get happiness or that others must provide happiness to you. But you're free to pursue it. You're free to, to go that way. Now, I, I'd say one more thing that is somewhat controversial. Capitalism, you know, if you just ask financially what a business is doing, the argument will be they have a profit motive. And that's actually true. Now, the, the issue with profit is it, it's the net creation of value. It's not, as the socialists say, something that's robbed you know, from the workers or robbed from consumers by overcharging them. It is an earned income that goes to entrepreneurs, business leaders, and things like that, just as wages go to laborers and rents go to landlords and interests go to lenders. Profit is, uh, although a dirty word to many people, just a perfectly fine earned type of income. Now, just think of something like the profit motive. The motive
devoted part of it is you want to gain, you want to get ahead, you want to create something. You know, now I think those are all positive things. I mean, whether you're pursuing health or wealth, I mean, what's wrong with that? You want to be happier, wealthier, you want to live longer, you want to be healthier. But there is a, a, a certain questioning of that ethic. There is a certain belief that, well, if you pursue your self-interest, you must be harming others. This can't be a good ethic. Uh, and so that, that if you call it uh, Christian or Judeo, it's not really, it's not really necessarily only that. Maybe most religions, they do have the animus toward self-interest and, and rationality. A good thing. So you go on faith, you go on feeling sometimes. So uh, not all religious people are this way. There, there are religious people who can be pro-capitalist, but that is where you do get a clash where people will say, well, I understand that capitalism produces a, you know, a great uh, standard of living, but I feel a bit guilty about this system because it seems so secular, it seems so you know, pleasure-oriented, it seems so consumerist, all those kind of things you hear, I'm sure. Well, let's take a break and, and tease that out because it seems to me what people are saying versus what their take on it is very, I would say, negative in a, in, a, in a lack of a better way to put it. And let's tease that out because we've let people define what capitalism is, but I think they have an agenda. So on the note, let's take our first break. You're living in the solution. Understanding health insurance is becoming more challenging. If you currently have insurance, you probably noticed that it costs more to see your doctor. And if you're able to keep your doctor, it takes longer to get an appointment. There's bad news and good news. The bad news is this trend is predicted to continue. Your costs will likely continue to rise, while your health care choice and access will continue to fall. The good news is Peachtree ENT Center has the answer to this problem. We are committed to working with you. We specialize in providing affordable care for patients without insurance, those who are underinsured, and those with high deductible or catastrophic coverage and we offer same-day appointments. You no longer have to choose between staying healthy and paying bills because Peachtree ENT Center is where patient care counts. Call 404-591-9100 or visit us at peachtreeentcenter.com. Are you constantly on antibiotics for sinus infections? Do you need to take allergy medicine just to help you breathe? Are you having difficulty controlling your asthma? Have you lost your sense of smell? Maybe it's time to get to the root of the problem instead of just treating the symptom. At Peachtree ENT Center, we offer sublingual immunization to alleviate allergies to environmental and food triggers. It's a safe, effective, and economical way to retrain your immune system without needing to come to the office, and it doesn't require needles. By using drops under the tongue once a day, you can treat the problem instead of just medicating the symptom and improve your quality of life, because Peachtree ENT Center is where patient care counts. Call 404-591-9100 or visit us at peachtreeentcenter.com. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with Professor uh, and Dr. Richard Salzman. And before the break, he gave a really good primer again and, and a foundation for what capitalism has been used for, I think it's been using now, used as a weapon, because the things that people, that you just described, people feeling negative about, these are the same people who get to decide who, who wins and who loses, right? It's okay for this collective that most of the time, in my opinion, don't get there by merit. There's nepotism, there's cronyism, there's all these things. And they know from my perspective that they're not as good or savvy as people who actually sit there and do the work, whether it's an entrepreneur, a worker, whatever, and they have to game the system. So you get to decide emotionally, you play on the, the emotions of people and whether or not they have some sort of anxiety about something and you highlight it. But in actuality, it's a system that you cannot move up in because of whatever reason, your sex, your birth, where you're from, you're a perpetual victim and somebody did it to you. How did they end up being able to have the power to to say what capitalism is? Like they define healthcare, they define everything about how the society should run. But how did they get away with this? It's a good question. I think the main 
way they get away with it is by appealing to an e this ethic that questions individualism and questions the pursuit of self-interest. So, so if you um, well, I put it, go back to the original American system. Some, sometimes people ask me, you, you keep uh, defending capitalism. Tell me what the system is and when we've most closely approximated it. it it's really a system. It's, it's certainly not a system of anarchy. It does involve government, but it involves a very strictly constitutionally limited government that just protects individual rights. That's it. Now, what are individual rights? Well, they're, they're named in the founding documents, life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness. It's not a long list. But Dr. George, if you start adding things like, well, I have a right to uh, health care. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a house to housing, food, a sports team, you know, the yeah. long list you get of rights. The first thing to remember is those things do not grow on trees. People help provide health care. People provide housing. People provide food and clothing. And so the, the claim that you have the right, now, of course, the right doesn't be here. They don't mean I have the right to go buy it. You leave me free to go spend my income on these things. They, they're saying that health care providers, food, clothing, housing, apparel providers, must work for you, must basically be enslaved to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what capitalism rejects. That's what the American system rejects. But socialism, of course, says the opposite. We said this earlier, that it's you to society decides who is society who gains to be the leaders of society and they feel the need uh, and the right they feel to dictate who shall uh, provide for whom now it's obvious going to be in a system like that the producers the ones as you say who do the work the ones who are conscientious the ones who get up in the morning and work hard i mean they're, they're going to be the ones who produce and they're going to be the ones that the socialists have their eye upon for purposes of redistribution. And and what will they say on the other side? Well, they'll say the needy, this is very common, you know, the needy are in need. And how can you be so cold-hearted as to not to care about the needy? You know, well, if the needy are needy through no fault of their own, capitalism has always provided for that. There's always been such an abundance such a cornucopia of production of your capitalism that if you want to be charitable and give to the needy, you can. Nobody forces you to. But the welfare state does force you to. The whole welfare state apparatus, which we had today, that I've had for a century, is not capitalism. It's, it's forced charity, if you will. And it's getting worse and worse, and it's making people more needy. It's, it's proliferating neediness. Yeah, which is terrible and dependency and you see this today where they'll, they'll have a public health scare and they'll say everybody has to be on the government dole stay home take a government check don't go to work we have labor shortages today and people are unabashed about this and they and they pose as humanitarians uh helping helping the needy so that people have to realize today that the system we have is not capitalism it's more of a mixed system where there are partial freedoms obviously it was partial business and money making going on, but there's also this extensive socialistic type interventions in the economy. I think the great tragedy actually is that because there's this mixture, people cannot actually figure out and disentangle what's causing what. You know, as a doctor, if you see a patient and they're sick, the first thing you do in your diagnosis, I'm sure, is to figure out, well, is this due to their diet? Is mm -hmm. it the nutrition? Uh, are they ingesting some kind of poison, maybe lead poisoning or something like that? Mm -hmm. But the key would be you wouldn't mix up nutrition and poison. You you would say, I know what poison is. In my philosophy, poor, uh, socialism is poison. The government intervention and, and, and initiating force and mandates and decrees and all these things. Saying, to me, that's an invasion of the body politic. That's an invasion of liberty. That's a poison. And the free elements that remain are the nutritious elements. Sadly, today, if something goes wrong, people immediately blame capitalists. They literally go first to the idea, well, there's some remaining freedoms out there. That must be the problem. People are still free to some, de to some degree. There needs to be still more controls, more invasions, more taxes, more regulations, <laughs> more decrees. And it's, uh, it's either they got the diagnosis wrong or there's this bias toward blaming capitalism. Well, I think it's for a reason because it's about keeping the power structure intact. You know, if you have people mm. not paying attention to the bigger picture of losing their freedoms, 
of their standard of living dropping, of their healthcare access and quality going through the floor, mm-hmm. then they can't pay attention. Mm-hmm. And it, honestly, it's becoming too classy. So my question for those folks who talk about socialism and egalitarianism, everybody being equal and sharing the wealth, yeah. it doesn't happen. It doesn't, I mean, the standard of living is dropped for everybody while they're trying to tell you you should like it. <laughs> but who stands to gain? People who are friends of, just like the bureaucrats in socialist countries, they're living, they're eating steak, they're doing wonderful things, they're having their children get fiefdoms. We're seeing that every day where everybody else is paying more taxes and living worse and hoping for the, like it's going to trickle down to them or something. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It, the whole system of socialism is, is like the animal farm. Some people are more equal than others, and then they're trying to gaslight people into thinking that it's okay. That's how I see it. Well, the animal farm reference is so apt. You know, they, there is such a thing as cronyism. Maybe we should talk about that. Absolutely. The, the idea of a crony, uh, fa- uh, you know, people who are favored uh, and get special favors, uh, well, it's often announced as special interest groups are at the public trough, you know, versus the general uh, interest or the, uh, the general welfare. Um, it, my theory is that, co- that corruption of that kind and favoritism of that kind, it's like it comes when you mix the economy. When you provide a mixture, because think of it, if it's just down to government uh, limited to protecting individual rights, it basically does not intervene much in the economy. It does not redistribute wealth or uh, heavily regulate or tax. Right now, if that's true, and the government doesn't really have that much power, there would be no reason to lobby the government to do anything for you, mm-hmm. uh, one way or another, either to get a tax break or to get a subsidy, or to get them to impose a, a regulation on your competitor. Is it because they would be, they would not have such powers. And, and what's, we, what's very weird is the people who advocate intervention, as they have for the past uh, century or so, they are precisely the ones who run around claiming it's cronyism, it's cronyism. Uh-huh. But their interventions have invited uh, have invited cronyism. So I'm I'm for getting rid of cronyism, but the root cause of cronyism is not, you know, wealthy people trying to bribe politicians. Yes, they do do that. But you know, again, if these politicians had no favors to peddle, there wouldn't be any um, seeking of such favors. So now, but but say to people now, well, we need to back, you know, massively uh, reduce the size and scope and power of government. They just won't do it. And the sad thing is, notice at the end of the day, the phrase out there is crony capitalism. Right? Notice it's never crony socialism. Mm-hmm. But as I told you, we have a mix, we have a mix today. So there's just, you could say there's just as much socialism as capitalism. But yet, yet the fact that they use the phrase crony capitalism is a sign that they're still blaming capitalism. They're still blaming the innocent uh, liberty aspect of our mix. So there's a lot of terminological issues that have to be fixed here as well. By the way, the reason I really asked where have all the capitalists gone is just a bit of history here. And it sounds like you and I are old enough to remember this. It sound like old folks sitting here on the back porch. <laughs> In my day, things were much better. I had to <laughs> walk to school. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was focusing on uh, the last 20 years of the last century. So I'm thinking 1980 to 2000, okay? Um, in 1980, uh, before Reagan was elected, uh, things were pretty bad in the U.S. Uh, the 70s, you'll remember uh, gas lines and hyperinflation and high mortgage rates and stagnation. And, and Reagan and first Thatcher, actually, Thatcher in Britain, then Reagan were elected. And so the 80s and 90s generally, uh, even after they left office, their successors, were for the most part pro capitalist. It was a very interesting two decades because the countries of the world were moving toward capitalism, more toward capitalism. And notice in the middle of all that, the Soviet Union disbanded. Mm-hmm. I mean, the U.S. won the Cold War. It was, it was remarkable. And all the Soviet satellites, uh, East Germany, Bulgaria, Romania, and others, Czechoslovakia, also were liberated. Hey, Poland. Professor? Let me stop and you. So Let me stop you there. So, we're gonna we yeah, got a yeah, hard break. Yeah. So pick that up and we come back on yeah. the other end. You're living in the solution.
Welcome back to Living Solution. We're speaking with Professor Richard Salzman, and you need to go to his website, richardsalzman.com. And before the break, you were giving, and I remember back in the 80s when it seemed like capitalism was taking over the world, even Russia, as you, as you described before the break, and they broke apart and they started to really move their economy away from this planned bureaucratic socialist communism agenda, and they were really moving that yeah. way. So I'm sorry, I mean to cut yeah. you off before the break, but please continue. No, that's okay. Yeah, so, so uh, part of what I recount in the book uh, is, and here I'm using the word capitalist as advocates of capitalism, from the end of World War II until 1980, now that's only, what, that was only like 35 years. In those three or four decades, there were about a dozen great advocates of capitalism. They just were. That in the economic, on the economic side, there were people like uh, Ludwig von Mises, Frederick Hayek, maybe some of your listeners have heard of them, Milton Friedman later in the 70s, uh, Milton Friedman in the 70s and 80s was, was um, popular. James Buchanan, a lesser known name, but won the Nobel Prize in 1986, a great pre market economist. On the artistic or fictional side, if you will, people like uh, Ayn Rand, who wrote uh, The Shrug and Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal. Uh, Robert Nozick at Harvard, even in places like Harvard, they were starting to get what they called libertarian uh, philosophers, uh, focus on uh, versus others. The point being, um, ideas have consequences. And if you get a series of really good, uh, profound, influential leaders uh, and intellectuals, thought leaders, if you will, it can have an enormous impact. So it isn't just the, the can I say the practical failure of socialism that was obvious in the Soviet Union. I mean, that had been obvious for uh, decades. Also obvious, by the way, in China under Mao, so or, or Cuba or North Korea. Just the list goes on and on. So during these decades, it wasn't as if the socialist failures weren't known. There just has to, however, be a case for capitalism. That's really key. Mm -hmm. uh, here's an example, by the way. Before Donald Trump, I think, I'm trying to think which State of the Union it was. Might have been his last. He very interestingly said something like, no, knowing the squad was out there, knowing AOC were out there, Bernie Sanders, he said, America will never become a socialist country. Now, I like that sentiment. I, I like the idea of, yes, I hope we certainly don't become a socialist mm -hmm. country. <laughs> But notice that, but notice that, notice the defensiveness. You know, what if he said instead, America must become a more capitalist country, yeah. a freer country? Yeah. Um, that would be, that would be a much more radical statement, right? And it's not something Trump would say, and not because he is a, you know, pro American, but it's that, it's that, what, that is what we had actually in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s by these advocates of capitalism. They weren't out there just saying socialism is terrible. These thinkers that I recount in the book, and it's not the only part of the book, it's just a section of the book. Um, they were coming out saying, no, it's moral and practical. It's not just the practical system. It's also got this great individualist morality. It's got this great can-do spirit. It's got this individualism. This is what these thinkers were advocating. And they are all pretty much past by now. If you look at those people I recount, they're all in their grades. Okay, well, that alone is not a problem because they should have successors, mm -hmm. right? They should have students who carry the banner, who carry the torch, and that has been lost. The last 20 years, uh, now we're talking 2000 to 220 now, have been, have been a reversal of what happened in the last, in the prior two decades. And that's tragic. It had we built in the last 20 years and we built on the successes of the 1980s to 2000 period, uh, we'd all be much happier, much more prosperous, much less at each other's throats. And so that's the, the kind of mystery out there. That's the kind of paradox. If you, if you get a system that is widely recognized at the turn of the century as not only peaceful but prosperous, you have to wonder why would people not, why would people turn their backs on that? Why would they go the other way? Why indeed would they say something like, let's try democratic socialism? Well, why? If socialism failed, which it did miserably, and not just economically, I mean, it murdered people. It had forced famines. It had uh, illiberalism through and through. The feeling is that, well, if we just voted it, if it's not done by tyranny, if it's not done by revolution, if it's done democratically, maybe it'll be done better. 
Uh, and that's, some, that's another premise we have to question. You can get tyranny, even with democracy. You, get, you can get people voting for what turns out to be tyranny. They did that in Venezuela. Mm-hmm. So Venezuela has been in dictatorship for about 20 years. Uh, people forget that in 98 and then 2002, they voted for Chavez down there. They voted for Madero. So um, America could easily go that way. You could say that it actually is going that way. It's voting for leaders <laughs> who are not pro capitalist Well, that's another question Which about voting. Kind of <laughs> we have a question yeah. about whether that vote was actually mm-hmm. correct, valid. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's yeah. you, you bring yeah. up an excellent point with Venezuela. I mean, they were the jewel of the Caribbean and the South America. They, they were giving money to the smaller yeah. islands to help their economies. They were living well. So my question, I mean, what was the mindset that made them literally cut their own throats almost? I mean, it's was it social? Because right now well, we're seeing yeah, a they, social they, movement. So what do you think it was? You mentioned earlier, a, a really good point you mentioned earlier, egalitarianism, if you say to an American, uh, what do you think of equality? Mm-hmm. Um, when, I teach, uh, when I teach my students at Duke, I say, you know, there's, yeah, so there's three types of equality, and they clash. So you have to distinguish which is the legitimate one and which is not. The standard American approach had been equality before the law, meaning regardless of who you are, you're treated the same before the law. So if murder is illegal, it doesn't matter what color you are, what gender, what height you are. If you're a murderer, you're a murderer, right? So it's the idea of treating people equally before the law. Mm-hmm. Uh, equality of result. Uh, is what egalitarians demand. So that's not really equality in a justice sense because people are different. They're different in their uh, endowments at birth. They're different in their motivations. They're different in their career choices, right, in their conscientiousness mm-hmm. and uh, in their moral choices. And so they're going to have unequal results. Uh, they're going to be unequally healthy, unequally happy, unequally in wealth. And if you have a, um, a system that says, I'm okay with that, I'm okay with diversity. So long as people aren't hurting each other, I can respect differences. I can respect variety. Uh, if you have a culture that doesn't like that, it hates it, uh, in fact, is possibly envious of those who are more successful, you're going to get a culture where people are trying to tear down greatness. They're tearing down or trying to sap the strength of those who are able. And that happened in Venezuela. I mean, it has it's happened in many regimes that went from freer more socialist. Probably see that in America today. You started the show quite rightly by saying, you know, I can just, especially if you're older, you can detect a change in a culture that goes from more individualist and self-reliant to more uh, victimology. I'm a victim. Uh, I have to, uh, you know, impose myself upon others to correct this. It's a very different mindset. It, it is taught. Uh, it's not in our genes or in our blood. This is a change of thought, and it's taught in the secondary schools, elementary schools, colleges. It's just a different philosophy. And so we need to go back to equality before the law, because think of this. If you emphasize equality of result, which is literally unnatural, it is not true that people are clones of each other. Mm-hmm. But if you try to make them clones of each other, notice what you have to do. You have to treat them differently before the law. You have to engage in the acts like, you know, whatever, affirmative action, redistribution of wealth, you know, tax some people at 80% and give a check to other people. Notice how in every field you would treat them differently Mm -hmm. before the law. So the requirement that we end up all equal isn't just some add-on to the principle of equality. It's something that necessarily has to smash the true form of equality, which is equality before the law. That's, by the way, why people are starting to complain about a two-tier justice system or, you know, why are they treating this group this way and another group another way? That used to not be the case in America, especially when we got rid of the systematic racism and sexism. It's coming back, isn't it? Very it's much the identity so. politics is the idea of, no, I'm going to pay attention to the color of your skin. No, I'm going to pay attention to your gender. I'm going to obsess about these things, in fact. And then I'm going to treat you differently before the law. It's a complete inversion uh, of the original American system. You know, I would even go further. Not only are you paying attention, but you're you're committing the same moral crime on the opposite end by 
demonizing people by their skin color. If you happen to be white, if you happen to be male, then you're you're the enemy and you need to be discriminated against in order to right the system. It is so skewed. It's so immoral and unethical. And yet it's they're using a bully pulpit to push it through when they know. And people know this. I think people who are fair will sit back and say, well, this two wrongs don't make a right. And there's no way that you can say we haven't moved as a country. And when you compare us to other countries, for example, it was just negates whatever whatever good is about the country. And there's a lot more good than there is bad, obviously. You don't want to live back when we were living under Jim Crow, et cetera. But that's not where we are. But it says a lot about our country that we move forward past that. You know, and anybody who sits there and just stays silent, to me, is not helpful in this situation. So let's take our last break and come back. You're living in the solution. You're listening to Living in Solution with Dr. Elena George, consumer healthcare advocate. If you miss Living in Solution, you can catch it on DrElenaGeorge.com, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and a host of multimedia platforms. You can follow her on Positive Solutions on Telegram and Living in Solution on Facebook. Subscribe and share it with your friends. Do you have problems with sinus pain and pressure? Do other people smell things that you don't? Have you lost the joy in eating because food just doesn't taste like it used to? Is your nose always stuffy no matter what you do? Maybe you have sinus or nasal polyps. These are generally benign growths that occur from a chronic sinus infection or allergies that are either undertreated or have not been treated at all. At Peachtree ENT Center, we specialize in minimally invasive balloon dilation surgery and correction of a deviated septum, as well as turbinate reduction surgery, all which can be done in the office. We use a state-of-the-art nasal telescope with a video camera so you can see the problem. You will be a partner in your care and together we'll decide the course of action. Our philosophy is simple, to fix the problem, not just medicate the symptoms. But rest assured, all options will be offered before surgery is recommended because Peachtree ENT Center is where patient care counts. Call 404-591-9100 or visit us at peachtreeentcenter.com. Welcome back to Living the Solution. We're speaking with Dr. Richard Salzman. And again, you need to go to his website, richardsalzman.com. Richard and last name, S-A-L-S-M-A-N.com. And his works are there and you can read his bio and you can read a lot of links that are really just fascinating. And it's almost like a one-stop shop. So you can actually start your, your process of doing your own due diligence and educating yourself. And that's what, to me also, Professor, which really irritates me, there's a glorying in ignorance. I mean, it's just the dumber you are, the, the more play you get, and you are just glorified. And that's ignorance isn't bliss in this case, and it's really breaking our country apart. And the people who it hurts the most, to me, are the people who, who actually gained under capitalism or, or that approach of the individual. You are, if you work hard and you have a talent and a skill, you succeed. In this position now, it's your a yoke around your neck or emotionally, you can't ever say that I worked hard and got somewhere. It's because of my genetics or my skin color. It's very irritating and it demeans humanity, in my opinion. I agree entirely. So, uh, so the two real uh, premises that need to be reinstalled and reappreciated in America, really globally, is uh, reason and rationality are our best faculties, are our main critical ways of succeeding. And that'll sound uh, you know, overly robotic to some people, especially in today's world where emotions are held out as primaries. And that, but then the second thing, free will. We really have to reject this idea that we are products uh, of our environment or our blood gender and all these things that if you if you wed those two things together one i'm a free agent i can make choices mm -hmm. and two i'm going to make choices based on reason and logic and facts not emotions you're going to be much more successful as a person now if the culture broadly believes those things and starts enshrining them in the laws and in the mores and in, even in things like the movies and the arts um, it becomes a much more enjoyable place to live. People are not going to be at each other's throats 
that their primary means of dealing with each other is persuasion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think another way of looking at this would be to say, if in the universities or elsewhere, in the intellectual fields generally, if there's a denigration of reason, if there's a denigration of the idea that we can be objective, or that we can be factual or logical, that is going to lead people to all sorts of excuses for dealing with each other by other means. But what are the other means other than screaming at each other, getting emotional with each other, possibly fighting with each other, getting in the streets and burning and looting and torching things? I mean, the, the violence we see, the crudeness we see of interactions among people, it, it be, it could call it animalistic. You mentioned animal farm. It's animalistic. It's not human. It's not humanistic. But it's got to be that way if you surrender this great human tool called reason. That is the thing that most distinguishes us from the beast, if you will. And we're going to be beast-like if we're not going to be objective and rational. So um, you can see I feel passionately about this, even though I'm pro-reason. <laughs> you can still be. Still be emotionally committed and wedded to this. I think the other thing you're seeing, frankly, is I think there has been a default on the part of the intellectuals. I mean, I'm in academia, I'm a professor. I want the professors in all fields to be much more rational, much more pro American, much more pro constitutional, pro campus than they are. But I can see why the general public, especially the well meaning general public who loves America and wonder why we're losing this lost faith in the leaders that the leaders have been pretty bad uh, i think one thing that happens is when you have the government doing things it really should not be doing it starts attracting political leaders who are no good i hate to say this but hayek said this in the road to serfdom one of his chapters was why the worst get on top and what he basically said is if you have a system that's fundamentally corrupt you allow the government to do all sorts of crazy things guess what the leaders will start being crazy. The leaders will start being authoritarian. They won't be Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, or Abe Lincoln anymore. They're going to be more authoritarian. They're going to be more capricious. They're going to be more like a, a totality because they're attracted to unlimited power. Mm -hmm. And so when we scratch our heads and say, oh my gosh, how do, I won't name names, but when, pe when people from all sides, why is our current president so authoritarian? Why are they so narcissistic? Why are they so, why are they just issuing executive orders and decrees from the White House? Now, now the last three or four presidents have been like that. Why? Because the government itself is out of control. And uh, the only people who are going to run for office are precisely those who are eager to wield power. Wow, that you're just describing a slippery slope. And, it, you know, it seems to me it that is, it started yeah. with government doling out money. As soon as the money gets involved, people just seem to lose their minds and they all they, it's like a pablum. They just can't mm -hmm. handle it, you know, and that goes mm -hmm. throughout the healthcare system, mm -hmm. for example, under the Affordable Care Act. There was so much money being poured into the states to follow, to yeah. subsidize the Affordable Care Act. Nobody bothered to read the small print, which was if you don't do what we say, we're taking the money back. So there was a lot of go along, get along, and pronouncements that push this thing along down the road that it's at now. I would think the same thing happened from a on the academic level, didn't it? I mean, the government money pouring into universities when they have yes. endowments that can choke a horse, the bigger than country's GDP. Yes. Why do they still get, what, what's going on there? How come they still get money from the government? <laughs> and therefore they're immune they to whatever the parents want. They lobby, they lobby as actively as business does for other things. And, wow. But yet, if the National Science, if the National Science Foundation, the National Institute for Health, and others didn't exist, they, they couldn't lobby for them. Yeah. So they really should not exist. But uh, yes, it does affect the research. It biases the kind of research that's done by universities. For example, you can't get anything funded that questions uh, the climate change paradigm. You can't get anything that questions the idea that mandate that, that all vaccines should be mandated and you should be masked and you should distance. I mean, all these crazy non-scientific things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are often, yes, funded by, they're often funded by government, yes, sadly. It's really, and there's this connection between private, public-private partnership. For example, the CDC, which is making all these pronouncements, I don't think most people know that it's a private corporation, that it's not a government agency, mm -hmm. but it's been given license mm -hmm. to kill, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, whatever they want, mm -hmm. they get to push through, but 
there's so many conflict of interests woven through that system. And nobody seems to have any, there's no oversight. There's nobody who can say there's a conflict of interest. Let's pull this back a bit. And it's, it's, you know, just, uh, yeah, just, you know, just as we talked, we talked about socialism broadly as a system that fails badly and that is inhumane. It's true of socialized medicine. It's just a particular application to the field of medicine. But it's been it's well known and broadly documented by economists that socialized medicine uh, kills the system and then kills the patients and then makes the doctors not want to be doctors anymore. And um, and yet people vote for this. Uh, in the mid '60s, we got Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, people warned at the time that if you start if the government starts financing healthcare, eventually it's going to come in and start regulating how the healthcare monies are spent. Mm -hmm. Well, at the time, the advocates the advocates said, no, 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 don't worry, that'll never happen. That's exactly what's happened. And whereas government funded maybe five percent of healthcare expenditures in the 1960s. It's now surpassed 50%. So it's a talk about a mixed system. It is now half the money spent in healthcare is, is spent by government, meaning wastefully, corruptly, um, in ways that's running people of the mind, doctors, nurses, I would say even pharma inventors out of the, out of the field. But that already happened in Britain. It already happened in Canada. Mm -hmm. It already happened in France, Australia. There are so many cases of this. It's not as if it's a mystery. And, and so that's, I think, why you have to say, listen, that route you need to argue for capitalism, not just generally, but in this case, capitalist medicine. It, it's a Herculean task, given how much government has intervened. That's true. But, um, it, when, when people complain about the status of the healthcare system today, it is not the capitalist element. And I, I know you know this. Oh, I absolutely do. It's the do. socialist element that's growing. Well, it started really off with these the government and also these insurance companies who've inserted themselves with the help of the government into the doctor-patient relationship and it, specifically into the patient pocketbook. Mm -hmm. Whoever has that pocketbook has the power. And there's no reason for an entity that doesn't do anything to have this much power over decisions mm -hmm. that the patient should be making. And I would go further. Not only are they having a, a, a say-so on the delivery of healthcare, but socially too. So, I mean, I'm seeing, I don't know if it's really come into play yet, but it was mentioned that they were going to tie doctors' licensure to following this system. They're mm -hmm. going to make sure the patients mm -hmm. don't smoke or don't drink soda or all these things that are messing with your personal choices in order to get a crumb. So this is, I mean, anybody who's paying attention should see where this is going. It's always moving towards less choice for you, more totalitarian uh, oversight of your behavior and your quality of life. And I think Life and death, that's where it's moving, don't you think? Absolutely. Well, if, you, if you have a broad sweep of history, you might say something like cases of liberty, freedom, security, and prosperity are actually quite rare, historically. So um, the normal case, I hate to say it, is uh, tyranny and poverty and inhumanity. <laughs> And so this is so precious. This is such a wonderful thing that America was founded during the Enlightenment. And it's such a, a wonderful thing. And here we are living amidst the vestiges of the Enlightenment. People really need to understand it, uh, advocate reason, advocate individualism, advocate the pursuit of self-interest and happiness. Don't let them guilt you or fear you into anything. Two best ways to control people. Make them afraid and make them feel guilty. And that's what they're doing. Ameri the American way is to stand up and say, I am my own person. I don't feel guilty. I'm not hurting anybody. Let my let me make way for myself. And also, you're not going to uh, create phobias. There's phobias all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. These people are trying to scare us into uh, staying in our homes, not working, uh, taking a government check. So we need to reject those two things. And the, and the only antidote to fear and guilt is uh, reason and self-esteem. I couldn't have said it better. I think that's a great place to end because it's a call to action. So in the minute that we have left, how can people read your book um, and, and go, to you, go to your website and find out more information about what, everything that you do? Well, that'd be great. I'm in a, many different places. So the central place to go is uh, richardsalsman.com. That's S-A-L-S-M-A-N. 
Sydney. And from there, it's like the hub and spoke system almost. When you go there, you can click on at least five or six different other places that might interest you. So if you if you want to see what I'm doing with Duke, you can click on Duke. If you want to see my economic essays, I've worked for part time for the American Institute for Economic Research. If you if you're interested in the stuff I do, I, I work for the Atlas Society and they try to promote the ideas of Ayn Rand, who was a, really a pro capitalist thinker. You can go there as well. So the book itself is linked uh, to Amazon, but you can go to Amazon directly. Last time I checked, it's uh, about twenty two dollars in paperback. They also have a uh, Kindle edition for nine dollars, and I think they're working on an Audible version of it. So various ways to get the book. I think you'll really enjoy it. It's not written in a professor's language. It's written in language that the general audience can understand, but uh, you'll learn a lot. I'm sure they will. You know, Professor, thank you so much for coming on. I think we just scratched the surface. I'd love to have you come back on anytime you want, because this is important. This is our future. And if we don't have a a facility with understanding what's going down, we're going to be victims. So I want, again, thank you for your time. It was an absolute pleasure. Dr. George, thank you so much. I'd be delighted to come back anytime. Excellent. And thank you, everybody, for living in the solution.